Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rose Jansen, and I'm with the Academy of Science St. Louis, and we're very pleased that you were able to join us here tonight for one of our science seminars. Uh, this is uh, a partnership series that we do with the St. Louis Zoo. And before we get started, I'm going to take just a couple moments to tell you a little bit about who we are and mention some upcoming events, and then I'll introduce tonight's speaker. So if you're not familiar with us, we're an independent science organization, and we've been around since 1856, so for a very, very long time, and we promote the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation. We do that through a very broad range of either free or low-cost public science seminars, trips, tours, talks, lectures, workshops, and venues throughout the metropolitan region. And you can find more information on the Academy and our community-wide events by logging onto our website at academyofsciencestl.org, or there are some brochures and flyers and literature outside the auditorium at a table that's just over to your right. Feel free to pick any of that information up and take it with you before you leave tonight. You may also visit us on Facebook or Twitter. If you are interested in helping to support the Academy's many science opportunities for both students and adults throughout the region, there is membership information also at the table outside the auditorium. And if you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy public lectures and events, there will be some e-news sign-up sheets that'll make their way around the audience tonight. If you're a student and you need to verify attendance, we will have cards you can pick up from us tonight also at the Academy table outside the auditorium and after the Q&A some upcoming events that you might have an interest in attending. On Monday, December 9, University of Missouri St. Louis economics professor Dr. David Rose talks about the moral foundation of economic behavior from 9.30 to 11 a.m. at the center of Clayton. It is $10 to attend and registration is required and you can register online through our website or by calling 314-537-7889 and that is this coming Monday. Uh, professional photojournalist and writer Randall Hyman takes his audience on a fascinating journey exploring glaciers, sitting astride icebergs, peering down seal holes in the frozen Arctic Ocean, and edging along sheer cliffs amid breeding seabirds in shattered Arctic. That's also on Monday, December 9, and that is here in the Living World Auditorium at 7.30 p.m. It's free and open to all. Academy trustee and Sun Edison chief scientist Dr. Graham Fisher talks about semiconductors and from sand to silicon on Wednesday evening, March 5, from 7.30 to 9, also here in the Living World Auditorium. One of the world's foremost Alzheimer's disease researchers and 2013 Academy Outstanding St. Louis scientist, Peter H. Raven Lifetime Achievement Award recipient, Dr. John Morris, will be here in the Living World Auditorium on Wednesday evening, April 2 to talk about advances in Alzheimer's disease research. And then finally, on Tuesday, December 10, Associate Teaching Professor of Media Studies at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, I can never pronounce her last name, Dr. Christy Tucciaroni, talks about from Mad Men of the 1960s to today's Chicago ad execs, how pop culture influences career choice, and that's in conjunction with an exhibit that's on display at the Missouri History Museum called the 1968 exhibit. Her talk is from 7 to 8.30 p.m. in the Lee Auditorium at the Missouri History Museum. And again, on December 10, it's free and open to the public. You can find even more science opportunities, talks, and tours on the Academy website or listed on the event flyers and Academy literature that's available for you to take with you before you leave this evening. So with all that said, I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Audrey Odom. Dr. Odom earned her undergraduate degree in biology and PhD in biochemistry from Duke University and her MD from Duke University School of Medicine. She completed a residency in pediatrics at the University of Washington and was a pediatrics infectious diseases fellow at the University of Washington in Seattle from 2005 to 2008. She is currently assistant professor of pediatrics and molecular microbiology at Washington University School of Medicine here in St. Louis, where she is also a pediatric infectious diseases consultant and principal investigator. Dr. Odom and the Odom Research Lab study the malaria parasite, Plasmodium, I may not pronounce this correctly either, Falciparum, Falciparum, Falciparum. Uh, a major global health problem. Her research focuses on isophrenoid metabolism, which is a promising target for new antimalarial drug development. And she's here with us tonight to talk about malaria by the millions, developing antimalarial drugs in a changing environment. So on behalf of the Academy of Science St. Louis and the St. Louis Zoo, won't you please join me in welcoming Dr. Audrey Odom. Uh, 
Let's see if we're all hooked up. Can everybody hear me okay? Terrific. So uh, thanks so much, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to talk to you about really one of my favorite subjects, which is uh, malaria. So I'm going to really give you a, a, a general introduction to this disease and the parasite that causes it, and then talk about some of the challenges in, in controlling malaria in today's society and uh, some strategies that we hope will be fruitful in the future for, uh, for managing this disease. So um, I'm a physician. I uh, am a, a pediatric infectious disease physician at St. Louis Children's Hospital, and I give a lot of talks to medical students and doctors. And one of the rules of thumb in talking to doctors is you always have to start with a case. And uh, when you talk about malaria, there's not a lot of drama with the case, but I think this, in this particular case, but I think it really it highlights a lot of the major features of this disease and why it's globally important. So this is a patient, and I've removed all the identifying information from, uh, from this child that I saw when I was a pediatric infectious diseases fellow at um, Seattle Children's Hospital in Seattle, Washington. She uh, came to us after three days of increasing fevers. She was 10 years old, and she was on a trip to the U.S. from Ghana with a youth choir. Um, so she was with uh, her host family that she was staying with. No relatives um, were available, and she told us she'd never had malaria. Um, she was very mildly anemic, and um, the diagnosis was really not at all a, a mystery. She had malaria parasites in her blood smear. So we treated her with an antimalarial therapy, which was standard at the time, and she had absolutely no complications and got better right away. So what, is the, what, are, what features of this are, are compelling to teach us about malaria? Well, she said she never had malaria. That's what she told us, but that's really pretty unlikely because malaria is hyperendemic in Ghana. And in fact, in that country, one out of five children that are born in that country will die of this disease. That's not one in five children will die. More than that will die, but one in five alone will die of this disease. Since on average, every mother in Ghana has eight children, that means just about every mother in this entire country has lost a, lost a child to one single disease. She was anemic um, and very mildly anemic, but we know that on a population basis, anemia significantly affects uh, neural development. So with every gram of hemoglobin that you lose, you lose some IQ points. And 1.8 uh, IQ points for any given person is probably not gonna make a difference, but you spread that over an entire continent of individuals and it's a huge economic effect. Um, she was treated with this uh, standard therapy, etovaquone progonal, which goes by the trade name in the US of Malarone. Malarone's not an expensive therapy for a life-saving treatment, so it's about $45 a course, which is really not a lot in America for drugs. But to put that, that in perspective, in the country she came from at the time, the average annual income was $450. So you'd have been spending about 10% of your annual income on one tr 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 treatment course for this disease. And on average, 10% uh, of uh, Ghana's GDP and their entire healthcare budget goes to antimalarial therapy. She had no complications. She got better right away, which is very typical of someone who's lived in an endemic area for a long time. They're semi-immune, and they don't typically get um, that sick. But uh, again, when you think about the economic impact of this disease, the average Ghanan adult loses 3.46 days per month to this disease. And that alone, those loss of work days, result in a loss of 6% of their annual income. So you're losing 3.46 days per month, 6% of your annual income because you just can't work. And every time you get sick, you spend 10% of your annual income getting better. And that's not counting sick days for your child and the therapies for your child. So you begin to see the scope of this problem, and that's just one country. Um, I'll give you a, a, a slightly more lighthearted case, which is a, a more typical American case. This is a 50-year-old American man who traveled to Sudan. Um, he was given malaria prophylaxis treatment to take uh, before he traveled so that he wouldn't get malaria. But um, as is pretty typical for American travelers, he didn't take all of his drugs. And he came down with some fevers, um, chills, and exciting adventures in the toilet, and uh, just bad flu conditions with a little food poisoning thrown in to make you the perfect party guest. And it was very kind of him to share his story with the rest of the world. Um, he was diagnosed on thin smear, again, not a diagnostic dilemma, with uh, malaria parasites in his blood. And it was George Clooney. <laughs> and uh, he was very kind to share with us all how with proper medication, the most, most lethal condition in Africa can be reduced to a bad 10 days instead of a death. So this is the scope of the malaria problem, and this is still the scope of the malaria problem in the world. About half the world's population live in areas where malaria is endemic. Um, there, depending on who you ask, are about 
250 to 350 million cases of this disease every year, and there are nearly a million deaths every year. Almost all of those deaths are concentrated in really, as you can see, the poorest parts of the world, and almost all those deaths are concentrated in children under the age of five. So um, part of what I was asked to speak about today is, is why I'm interested in this disease and why I study this disease. And essentially, this slide tells you everything you need to know about why I wanted to study this disease. So I'm uh, trained as a biochemist, and I'm trained clinically as a pediatric infectious disease physician. And so when I was thinking about what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, what I wanted to make a difference in, I really looked at the list of things that are important to the health of children. And so this is the list of the leading causes of death in children outside of the neonatal period, so young children under the age of five. And you can see there are a lot of infections on this list. In fact, respiratory infections, diarrhea, malaria, measles, and HIV are all really topping the list in terms of uh, global impact. So um, when you're thinking about where I personally could make an impact, I can really only make an impact on things where the science is still important. And it turns out that um, we've made a great impact in the developed world on a lot of infections. And so we have vaccines for um, the major bacterial causes of pneumonia. We have vaccine for the major uh, viral cause of diarrhea. That's the rotavirus vaccine. And we have vaccines for measles. So although measles still kills over 300 million children every year, this still is staggering to me. Measles kills 300 million children a year. Um, it's a vaccine-preventable disease. And so I'm not a policy person. I can't convince law lawmakers to um, give money to uh, measles vaccines. I can't distribute those. But what I can do is, is understand the basic science of things. And where we're really missing um, basic science is in malaria, because these other diseases are either vaccine-preventable or, in the case of diarrheal diseases, the issue is not a lack of science or a lack of care, it's a lack of hygiene. So if we can uh, build toilets and get sanitary infrastructure, we can make huge differences in diarrheal diseases in children. So I'm interested in malaria because it's incredibly important and because the skills that I have, I think, can really contribute here. So the other uh, major um, uh, population that's affected by severe malaria are pregnant women. So pregnant women happen to be particularly susceptible to f severe malaria. And as you might imagine, this is bad for both mom and baby. So uh, pregnancy malaria is probably the number one infectious cause of miscarriage, stillbirth, low birth weight, prematurity, and ne neonatal death in the world. So again, just an enormous uh, public health problem. So I can't really put it better than the Director General of the World Health Organization who said, behind the statistics and graphs lies a great and needless tragedy. Malaria still takes the life of an African child every minute. So again, incredibly sobering, and I hope we're only gonna move up from there in terms of the uh, highlights of this talk. So um, malaria is a disease that's uh, caused by a protozoan parasite. This is a parasitic infection. It's not a virus, it's not a bacteria, it's a parasite that has a lot of biology that's actually just like ours. Um, it can't live outside of uh, host cells, so the parasite actually lives inside our cells and the cells of its other host, the mosquito. There are four species that infect humans, um, falciparum, vivax, ovale, and malariae. Um, but as I indicated before, almost all severe disease and all the deaths are due to a single um, species of uh, plasmodium parasite, plasmodium falciparum. And here you see really the typical appearance of uh, malaria in the blood smear of an uh, infected patient. So those, uh, those uh, pink spheres there are, uh, are your red blood cells, or the red blood cells of this patient. And you see sort of some circles with dots, those sort of headphone forms or uh, classic ring stage parasites. This one has uh, got only one dot. It's the classic signet ring appearance. And that ugly, uh, ugly banana-shaped thing is a gametocyte, the sexual stage of the parasite. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the malaria life cycle, which you really need to know in order to uh, understand all the uh, means to control uh, this disease, both vaccines and drugs. But it's a little hard to talk about it. It's a little dry. So some students in my lab were very kind and made me a video so that we could really, in a lighthearted fashion, tell people about the malaria life cycle using candy. So malaria, if this will work, uh-oh, uh no, no. Malaria is a disease caused by, come on, come on, yes, there we go. It's a disease transmitted by mosquitoes. So here's Marie the mosquito who finds her unwilling victim, bites, 
and leaves behind a gift, the malaria sporozoite, which makes its way to the liver first. There's this asymptomatic stage in the liver and grows and makes a ton more baby parasites. So all these parasites come out of the liver and they find their red blood cell where they begin to eat it and get bigger and bigger and bigger until they too explode out of the red blood cell. And then this just continues back and forth and back and forth. So the parasite goes from one red cell, gets bigger, explodes, and goes to the next red blood cell. In a more schematic form, this is what we're talking about. Again, this is a mosquito-borne infection. And uh, the important stages to talk to you about that I'm going to talk to you about today are this stage that's in the liver, um, and then this stage that's in the red blood cells, where they grow and develop in the red blood cells. They need to peel off and make those ugly banana things to be taken back up to the mosquitoes. But this liver stage and everything before you get to the red blood cells, that's what's targeted by all the malaria vaccine initiatives that are out there. And this blood stage, because the blood infection is really what causes all the signs and symptoms of malaria disease, that's the drug target. Um, so these are the two stages that you really need to be paying attention to for the, for the rest of the talk. So a big question, right, is can we control malaria? Horrendous burden, horrible disease, can we actually make a difference? And at least there's some historic evidence that that, in fact, is true. So um, did you know malaria used to be all over the US? It was even in Missouri. So malaria, this is a distribution of malaria in 1882 in the US. And so it was all the way across the, uh, the country. And in fact, a number of historians think that Lewis and Clark couldn't have made their journey if they hadn't taken with them Peruvian bark, which contained the antimalarial quinine. So malaria was uh, hyperendemic in the South. In particular, that's why the Centers for Disease Control was established in, in Atlanta. And I have a great letter from my uh, um, grandma's sister telling me how she was so annoyed growing up in South Carolina because she got malaria every summer. Um, but we know very rapidly we made incredible progress in eliminating malaria in the U.S. So by the uh, 1930s, we were uh, really eliminating, uh, it was all the way down to really the deep south. And of course, by uh, 2013, there's no endemic malaria in the United States. So we know that this disease can be controlled. So how do you control uh, malaria in the 21st century? Well, most investigators think there are really three strategies that probably need equal weight. In, uh, in developing malaria control uh, measures. One is vector control. That's um, either getting rid of the mosquitoes or keeping mosquitoes from biting people. One is vaccine initiatives. And you may have heard recently, there's been some really exciting uh, research on uh, malaria vaccines. And then a strategy that's, that's my particular favorite is development of new therapies to treat malaria um, to take care of patients once they get it. So uh, what do we know about vector control strategies and how well they work? So vector control, again, is the idea that you want to either prevent mosquitoes from biting you or, uh, or try to eliminate mosquitoes where they live in the environment. And there are a lot of ways that historically people have tried to do this, illustrated here by the seven dwarfs. So um, this is actually a malaria uh, informational video put out by the Disney Corporation in the 40s trying to teach people how to control malaria. So here the seven dwarves are sleeping under their bed nets to prevent being bitten by mosquitoes. Here we're doing outdoor control of mosquito habitats, killing the larvae in standing water. This is indoor residual spraying, spraying inside your house for mosquitoes. And this, uh, I guess this is unconventional biological medi remediation. Not been very successful. Um, but as you might imagine, since the main vector control measures have not changed since 1943 when uh, Disney made this video, it's not really been very successful in eliminating malaria from the, from the world. So while vector control measures absolutely save lives, particularly uh, children in endemic areas should always be sleeping under insecticide-treated bed nets, that's clearly not the only answer to how you're going to cure malaria and, and rid the world of this scourge. So um, what about vaccine research? Well, there's been some incredible buzz about malaria vaccines uh, in the world. And uh, over the last couple of years, some of the, the highlights have included New York Times articles and the Wall Street Journal reporting that the world's richest man told me I was about to be out of a job. So it's very sobering when you're a young uh, tenure track faculty member to have the, uh, the most world's richest man say that you're going to be out, out of job before you even have a chance to go out for tenure. So um, I was a little skeptical, um, and this is the data. So um, the main malaria vaccine that people, um, that's most mature and is most uh, ready to be rolled out 
is a vaccine that's known by the horrible name of RTSS ASO1. Um, and this is a GlaxoSmithKline vaccine. I'm gonna tell you what, um, what's in it. So um, as I mentioned, the um, vaccine strategies to prevent malaria target target the parasite before it even makes it into the bloodstream. So the idea is that someone gets bit by a mosquito and the parasite never even makes it into the, the, um, the red blood cells where they can cause disease. So they get interrupted some point, at some point before that. Um, and the protein that's in the malaria vaccine is a protein called CSP, and that is, stands for circumsporozoite protein. So you don't need to know much Greek because I'm gonna show you what that is. It's the protein that coats the outside of the malaria sporozoite. So I was trying to find some really good pictures of sporozoite so I could show you what one looked like. And it turns out you get great things when you Google image, things like malaria sporozoite. And what I came up with was, you know, this Etsy seller that makes these incredible cross-stitch parasites. So, you know, hint, hint, it's December. Um, um, but <laughs> the circumsporozoite protein is this protein that actually coats the outside of the malaria sporozoite. So as you might imagine, the idea is that um, you, you put this protein into, into children, they make antibodies that target that protein that kills the sporozoites before they have a chance to infect. So um, how well does this work? Well, there have been two huge clinical trials that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. One was published in 2011, and the other was just published in 2012. And the trials targeted two different age groups. So again, this is a, this is a disease of childhood, particularly in the first couple years of life. So the, the highest risk population are really children under the age of six months. The first um, uh, age group was five to 17 months. And uh, for those of you who are not, rem not well remembering what kids look like at that age, that's my daughter at about five months of age. And uh, at six to 12 weeks of age, and I think she's a little younger there, but we'll, we'll pretend she's six weeks. So um, pretty young infants, right? Five months is still quite a young infant. So they're, they're asking a lot of this vaccine to put it in children this young. So the strategy that they've used for um, testing whether this vaccine would work was to randomize children. So children were enrolled into the study and every child got a course of vaccines. Some of them got the malaria vaccine and some of them got a control vaccine. And because they wanted to do good, they wanted every child to potentially get benefit from being enrolled in this trial. The very young children got a, um, a vaccine uh, that's known to be um, efficacious against a, a type of meningitis that's very serious. And the other children got a vaccine for rabies, actually, which um, uh, is, is uh, a particular problem in sub-Saharan Africa. So every child got something good, but um, some of them got the malaria vaccine. And it was a pretty intensive course, so they got three doses of their, uh, their vaccine um, prior to um, enrolling in the, uh, uh, in the trial, and the primary endpoint was only a year into trial. And then they were also gonna do some trials on booster doses later. So what does the kind of data look like from these sorts of trials? Well, the real readout is they keep surveying all the children and they look to see which, which children get malaria. And then they just count them over time. So this is uh, on the uh, x-axis here is months since they got their first dose of vaccine. And uh, on the um, y-axis here is proportion of the um, children who got malaria. And so obviously over time, more and more kids are gonna get malaria and you get a rise. So the children that got the control vaccine, the line is here and this is the children that got the malaria vaccine. You can see those, those curves are really different. So there was clearly benefit to the children that got the malaria vaccine. But the, and the benefit was you know, not amazing. This isn't a measles vaccine that is really gonna work for everybody, but about half the children were protected against malaria. Even in this early trial, there were some worries because you see how nicely those curves diverge here and then they kind of parallel here so it looked like all the benefit might be very early on and they might need to reboost those children. So there were concerns even in the older babies. We knew that the younger infants were going to do worse. Young babies are really hard. They don't, they don't, uh, they don't respond to vaccines very well. Um, so we always knew the younger infants uh, were going to look worse, but we didn't know it was gonna be quite this bad. So this is the same kind of data from those young infants months since they got their third dose and then incidence of malaria. Again, the curves do diverge, so there was some, some protection from this vaccine. This, by the way, is the event rate for ch per person year. That's the likelihood that you would get malaria in a given year. Their control population, this is a very endemic area. Almost 100% of their children got malaria during the course of this treatment. 
and still 60% of the children that got the vaccine still got malaria. So there was protective efficacy, um, but it was not great. And then the really bad news was this, that there, although they had protection against getting malaria at all, in neither trial was there effect on severe malaria, that's life-threatening malaria, or death as an endpoint. So although these vaccines work, we can, I, I just showed you, they definitely work. They are not the, the answer to wiping out this disease. So because there is such hope for anything that might improve survival and anything that might make this disease better, GlaxoSmithKline is actually spending money and rolling out this vaccine, and the World Health Organization and the Gates Foundation are helping fund this. Um, but obviously, there's, this, is, this is not going to be the answer. There's still going to need to be more. So what are the other vaccine strategies? Well, um, very recently, there have been a lot more buzz, again, about a new malaria vaccine that might be a wonder vaccine and that had 100% efficacy and how amazing this would be. I hope you can hear the skepticism in my voice. So this is a difficult disease to vaccinate against. Um, so in this case, we're again targeting this stage before they get into the bloodstream. And the strategy here is truly science fiction crazy. They're giving people live sporozoites. So it turns out, if you give somebody a dead sporozoite, they don't get protection. You have to have them sort of in a Princess Bride-esque, mostly dead but partly alive state of being. So how do they do that? They take the same Plasmodium falciparum sporozoite and they zap it with radiation. So it's mostly dead but partly alive. And all it needs to do is be able to make it to the liver and then die. So that's the strategy. Right? And I'll just let you think about that for a second. How are you going to do this for an entire continent of individuals? But anyway, this is the strategy. And this is the data. This is all the data that got all the buzz. This is what got you the New York Times front page. This is on the Wall Street Journal. This is it. Look how many patients are in these studies. I don't think you need to know anything about clinical trials to know that six, nine, and six patients is not a lot. So they gave six patients no vaccine. They gave nine patients four doses of vaccine. They gave six patients five doses of vaccine. In this population, 60% efficacy. This population, 100% efficacy. For the parasite aficionados in the audience, I will also point out that the parasite strain that they used has not been in a human in 20 years. So not exactly the most robust parasite strain you might use, but yet, 100% efficacy, yay, New York Times. So there's some problems, right? <laughs> the doses that they gave were five intravenous doses. This is like going into the infusion center and getting your chemo five times. This is intravenous doses. This isn't something you can do out in the bush. Um, the vaccine comes from people having manually dissected mosquitoes and then zapping them with radiation. So this is literally people pulling apart mosquitoes under a microscope to get the sporozoites out. Again, some problems maybe with feasibility, maybe with scaling this up. And then the other issue is that kids aren't little adults. So we've protected six adults with malaria. That's not the population we need to protect. We need to protect six-week-old infants. And I think that even if this is a robust vaccine for adults, there's going to be safety concerns and, uh, and immunogenicity concerns for the young infants that are going to be really hard to overcome. So while there's a lot of hope, I mean, I am certainly the first person who would be delighted to be found wrong. I don't think we're likely to have the answer, the malaria vaccine, in the next couple of years. So what's left? Well, a major leftover problem with control of malaria is the fact that this tricky parasite keeps becoming res resistant to the best drugs we have. So um, we had chloroquine as the major therapy, the mainstay therapy for malaria for almost 100 years. Um, and now you can see on this map all the areas of the, the world where malaria is endemic, and all the icons show you areas where the parasite's resistant to what had been our three first-line therapies. And you can essentially see that everywhere where there's malaria, there's resistance to those therapies. Um, there are new therapies that have come out. Um, since 2003, I think, the World Health Organization standard of care is a drug called artemisinin. And by 2008, we have our start of reports of uh, delayed parasite clearance and resistance to artemisinin. So um, I was just recently at the American Society for Tropical Medicine, 
and there's a lot of fear of what happens when these Cambodian and Thailand uh, parasites make it to sub-Saharan Africa. So um, falciparum is not a major uh, global, major public health problem in these countries, but it is here. And when those parasites make it over, we're all in real trouble. So who's going to make new drugs to treat malaria? Clearly, we need an active pipeline for new drugs. But as you might, might imagine, uh, malaria is an infectious disease of poverty, and uh, drug companies are not so interested in getting, giving money away for, uh, to, for diseases where nobody can pay for the drugs. So there's not been a lot of commercial research and development uh, spent on uh, antimalarial therapies or really tropical medicine therapies at all. And that's really reflected in, then in what comes off the FDA pipeline. So this is a schematic of the drugs that have uh, been approved by the FDA since 1974. And you can really see how little attention has been paid to things like tuberculosis and tropical diseases that are not going to be a big money spinner. Um, so another major complicating factor in developing new drugs for malaria is this issue of the target product profile. So what does a drug need to look like to be a viable drug? What does a compound need to look like? So to, to explain a little bit what I mean, let me give you the example of um, this drug, vancomycin. So vancomycin is famous because it's the main therapy used to treat uh, resistant staph infections, MRSA infections. So if you come into our emergency room with a severe staph infection, this is likely the drug that you would be given. And obviously in the US, if someone has a life-threatening infection, we have no hesitation with giving therapies intravenously. That would be standard of care. You can give it as much as, as you need to. You can give it many, many times a day because you're gonna be in the hospital and we're all gonna take care of you. Um, you I mean, I can, would be hard pressed to imagine a serious infection in the US that we would treat for less than seven days. And we don't mind that it's expensive. I mean, we mind on a, on a global health perspective, but when your kid is sick in the hospital, it doesn't matter what it costs, you give it, give it to them and you get them better. That's not what we're looking for in a new malaria drug. What we're looking for in a new malaria drug is a drug that is only given orally. This is, again, not gonna be a population that can have intravenous therapy. Um, it can uh, only be given once or twice daily. Often, uh, malaria is provided to families in blister packs um, with uh, pictures of the sun and the moon on it because many uh, people who will be taking antimalarial therapy are not literate. Um, most most uh, investigators say at most you should have to give three days of therapy because more than that, it becomes very complicated for families and they can't do it. It needs to be 100% effective. If you're having to carry your child 10 miles to the nearest um, a, a drug, drug person to um, get them some antimalarial therapy, you can't go back if it doesn't work. And it has to cost pennies, of course, really less than a dollar to save a child's life is the goal for a new antimalarial drug. So obviously, it's an incredibly difficult uh, challenge in, uh, in developing new therapies. And the, to, again, put this in perspective to what we do in the US and what we're used to in the US, um, another uh, medication that's gotten a lot of buzz in the last year is a new drug for uh, cystic fibrosis, so a completely different disease that um, affects, that is a, a serious disease. And this is a new drug for a particular subset of children with cystic fibrosis. Um, and it turns out that this subset is only 4% of the patients with cystic fibrosis, and that puts it at about 1,200 patients in the entire of the US. So even though this is the only number of patients that we have in the US with this disease, it's an important disease, it's been well-funded, and uh, and so there's a drug that's available for those children, and it comes at a cost, almost $300,000 per year for every child to take this twice daily pill, and they will have to take it for the rest of their lives. So this is what we accept in a new drug for cystic fibrosis, and this is truly life-saving, amazing care for these children. And yet for an antimalarial drug, we're looking for 50 cents a course. So there are also safety concerns with a new antimalarial therapy, and this is true of vaccines for malaria as well. Again, our highest risk population are the young infants and pregnant women, and you might imagine the safety barriers to getting drugs approved for young infants and uh, pregnant women in the US, and that should be no different for the developing world. So um, what's the pipeline for new drug development? So um, I, I just wanted to uh, show you a little scheme of, of how drugs ultimately get approval in the US, so you have a sense of what, um, what the pipeline and what the process is. So obviously there is a lot of preclinical uh, drug development before we're willing to put a compound into people for the first time. But the phases of drug development that we talk about are phase one, two, three, and four. 
phase, and essentially they have, of course, increasing numbers of patients in each phase. So phase one trials, which is actually what that sporozoite vaccine was, are typically um, starting out with just handfuls of patients because you are really looking for safety concerns. You're looking for something that uh, would be highly toxic to a lot of people, and you don't want to give it to a lot of people to find that out. Um, so most drugs pass that um, safety barrier, so 70% success rate. Phase two trials, they're really looking at the efficacy. Does the, does the um, vaccine or therapy work? And that's what those um, larger uh, vaccine trials on the um, circumsporozoite vaccine were like, where there are hundreds of participants, so they really get a sense of how it works. Um, that's where a lot of uh, um, potential drugs fall off. And then as they uh, look at the dosing and the efficacy, again, drugs fall off. By the time you've got it uh, in lots of people, things are usually pretty safe. But you can see there's, there's some uh, barriers to success along the way once you've got it into people. Even worse, though, are the barriers to success before you even get it into people. So this is uh, what, it, uh, what the sort of um, uh, pyramid looks like in terms of the number of drugs that have to enter preclinical studies to ultimately end up with one registered drug. So you need at least 30 preclinical candidates to have a good shot of having at least one drug come off the end of the pipeline, because at each step, the, the rates of success are actually quite low. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our uh, preclinical uh, development of antimalarial drugs, and uh, our likelihood of achieving approval for our drug is pretty small. But so you have to really front load this um, preclinical pipeline, and we really need a lot of drugs entering this stage of, of uh, development in order to have a chance of having some, something come off the end. And I get asked a lot by people, well, how long does it all take? Well, once you start um, this whole process, if everything goes perfectly smoothly, you could potentially have registration with 10, 10 to 15 years. So it's not a fast process by any means. Um, about 20 years ago, I couldn't have told you about the antimalarial pipeline at all because it didn't exist. Um, and I really have to give a shout out to, um, as much as I was mocking him earlier, Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation um, for funding with the uh, World Health Organization this Medicines for Malaria Venture Group. So essentially all the antimalarial drug development that exists in the world right now is funded by the Gates Foundation and World Health Organization through MMV. And so there didn't used to be a pipeline at all. You could have a great idea for a new drug and there would have been no way to do it because there would have been no way to fund it and now there is. And this is really what the current state of the antimalarial pipeline looks like. Um, but just to point out some things that are, are still a little scary, it looks like there's some great successes, right? Things coming off the phase four clinical trials and getting approval. But as you look at them, notice the word art in a lot of these drugs. Here and here, these are all artemisinin-based therapies. If we have artemisinin resistance, they all fall off. So again, you can look uh, down the line. Chloroquine is in some therapies. There's other quinones in the therapies. There's a high likelihood for many of the drugs that are already well into the pipeline for resistance to develop and them to become uh, ineffective. So we really, again, need to front load this preclinical drug development, even though any given project is not likely to succeed, in order to have something coming off the end in five to 10 years that has a shot at, uh, at uh, being useful. So how do you find new drugs to treat a disease? So there are really two strategies that have historically been used. One is a whole organism screening, and this is sort of the classic thing of, I put my, my microbe of interest in a Petri dish, and I throw a bunch of compounds at it, and I look and see which compounds stop my, uh, my bug from growing. Um, and that has some great advantages, because you know that it inhibits parasite, parasite growth, but you don't know what the target is, and there's some disadvantages to that as well. Um, another strategy is uh, the one that we're using, which is trying to identify something that's special and specific to the uh, parasite that doesn't have, for instance, a human homologue, and that we know is absolutely required for parasite growth. So those aren't exactly a dime a dozen, but we think we have an idea of a way to do that. So again, the idea is here to bullseye in on the parasite, hurt the parasite, but leave the human host alone. And the strategy that we like in my lab are isoprenoids. So this is a malaria parasite in the shape of a heart. So um, I'm not going to bore you with isoprenoid biology, although it is one of my other favorite subjects. Um, but just to tell you a little bit 
about why this particular pathway is a great drug target. So um, all cells, every kind of cell needs isoprenoids, and really nature's come up with two different ways to get there, which is really useful. So humans get to isoprenoids by this pathway called the mevalonate pathway. This is the target of the statin drugs like Lipitor that lower cholesterol. Cholesterol is an isoprenoid, so um, it inhibits that pathway. Um, but the par malaria parasite and some other uh, really important and interesting um, microbes like bacteria and, in fact, tuberculosis use a completely different pathway. Um, and uh, those uh, microbes, like the um, gram-negative bacteria and tuberculosis and malaria are all really the kind of superbugs, the ones where we have a lot of problems with resistance. So the idea is that if we can take this, uh, if we can find inhibitors that target this pathway, we might not just treat malaria, but also get some of these other organisms that we're really interested in. So um, don't, don't look, don't look at the scary compounds, but so this is the schematic of the isoprenoid biosynthesis pathway in the parasite, and I really just want to highlight that we know very well from a lot of studies that that parasite absolutely requires this pathway to exist. And we have some really exciting um, uh, promise of this um, pathway from a drug called phosminomycin, which targets one of the enzymes of this pathway, inhibits that enzyme. And what makes phosminomycin nice to think about is that it really highlights the idea that if we can target this pathway, we can come up with a safe drug. So phosminomycin, for a lot of reasons, is not a great drug, um, but it's really non-toxic. So scientists use uh, a number called an LD50 to tell you how toxic a drug is. The LD50, this is kind of a horrible study, but this is the way it's done. They give so much compound to mice that it kills half the mice. So this is the lethal dose that kills half the mice. So the LD50 for phosminomycin is exceedingly high. And to put that on a sort of a scale for you, you can contrast that LD50 to something like caffeine. So it takes a lot less caffeine to kill a mouse than it does this drug, phosminomycin. In fact, it takes roughly the same amount of phosminomycin to kill a mouse as does paraffin. And paraffin is the main ingredient in, say, Crayola crayons. So this is an incredibly non-toxic drug. Um, which really highlights why we're interested in targeting this pathway. So we're targeting a particular enzyme of the pathway that I'm going to tell you about a little more, but I in particular want to highlight a number of the individuals that I'm working on in this project. When you're trying to do drug development, there's never a case where one individual has all the knowledge that they need in order to push this forward. Um, and so I work with some really brilliant uh, chemists at the University of Liverpool, uh, Paul O'Neill and Neil Berry, and a structural biochemist who's also at Washington University called Niraj Tolia. And so we're working together to try to find new compounds uh, that inhibit that particular enzyme and that kill malaria parasites. And I particularly want to put out a shout out for the, the agency that's funding our work. So all the work that I'm about to tell you about is funded by an agency that's based here in St. Louis, associated with St. Louis Children's Hospital called the Children's Discovery Institute. So this is quite literally uh, your money, the people of St. Louis at work. So this is an uh, institute that's funded through um, private donations to St. Louis Children's Hospital and to the Children's Discovery Institute to fund uh, um, uh, pediatric research. So I'm incredibly grateful for this support because as I mentioned, there's no way to get pharmaceutical companies to do this and this is not the kind of work that NIH wants to pay for either. So we quite literally could not do this work without the CDI. Um, and just to, again, put a, a shout out for anyone who might be in further interested in this uh, institute and the work that it does, um, here's the Children's Discovery Institute website. It's really a beautiful website. It tells you all about the researchers because, I'm, again, I'm so incredibly grateful for the support we've gotten from them. So um, how do you get a new drug when you have a target? So the main thing that we want to be able to do um, is to, to have robots do all the work, right? So we're going to put our protein in some plates and uh, put a whole bunch of compounds in those plates as well and look for compounds that inhibit our enzyme. So essentially you need some kind of readout where the enzyme is converting one thing to another and then you get some sort of change in absorption that a robot can read so that we can do this all in a, a very high throughput fashion. And I won't dwell on the chemistry here, but basically we came up with a really nice one where when our protein is active, it's orange, and when it's, oh, sorry, when our protein is active, it's green, and when it's inactive, it's orange. So normally all of this goes through and you get a green 
readout, and when our protein is inhibited, the whole thing turns orange. So you can see that physically on a plate, and the robots can read it really well. And so basically, you take that assay, and you run literally thousands of compounds to find out which ones inhibit your enzyme. Um, this is the kind of data you get from that. So again, our readout is absorption. And so each dot here is a particular well on a, on a microtiter dish that has our enzyme in it. And when our enzyme isn't active, for instance here where there's actually no enzyme added, you can see how low the absorption would be. And so even in our very pilot um, uh, data, these were not great looking compounds, you could see that we, it looked already like we were gonna be able to find compounds that inhibited our enzyme. So we didn't wanna have to screen 100,000 compounds because that's incredibly time consuming and expensive. So we really wanted to try to use smart strategies and let the computers tell us which compounds to, to, um, to screen. And so what um, we did, and this particular work was done by uh, Neil Barry, the chemist at Liverpool that I was mentioning, is we took a compound library at a company called Biofocus, and this is a nearly million compound library um, that has a lot of um, natural source um, compounds, so that's compounds that came from soil and fungi and things like that, which is where a lot of drugs come from. And he used um, computer algorithms, and don't ask me the details, because this I don't know, um, to sort through the compounds, looking for things that looked like they would inhibit our enzyme, looked like they would be um, orally absorbed, um, and that would also sample the diversity of this compound library. And from that, he identified 5,000 compounds that then we actually physically screened against our enzyme. So um, what happened next was that from those 5,000 compounds, 91 of them were hits. So 91 of them looked like they inhibited our enzyme. We use a number um, called an IC50 to talk about the concentration of drug that inhibits half the enzyme. Lower numbers are better here, right? So a more potent, potent drug will have a lower IC50. <clears throat> so 91 hits, which were not that great, and 14 that were pretty good, so lower IC50 values. From those hits, we identified one particular series that was looking really nice, and the intellectual property guys won't let me tell you what they are yet, but that's a good sign because you, can't t you can only tell people about them when they start to fail. Um, so we took our compounds and we began to modify them. And I say we, but this was really done by um, Paul O'Neill at Liverpool. So adding different groups, changing things around, swapping things around, they would send us compounds and we would see if they inhibited our target enzyme and whether they had any activity against uh, malaria parasites. And lo and behold, they did. So we've really explored this series and gotten quite a lot of compounds now. And graphed here is the enzyme inhibition using that number again, the IC50, so lower numbers are better and efficacy against the malaria parasite. So you can see that we have, in fact, identified a whole lot of compounds that inhibit malaria parasite growth. And what's really nice is you see there's a nice correlation between how well we inhibit the enzyme and how well we inhibit the parasite. So these compounds here are neither good inhibitors of our parasite nor of our enzyme, but these, in, these compounds here are exactly what we were looking for things that are really good and potent inhibitors of our enzyme and potent inhibitors of malaria parasite growth. So it really looked like um, we're, we're on target, we're inhibiting the enzyme within the parasite. Um, we really wanted to prove that, so we've actually used um, some uh, metabolic techniques to, to look at what happens in the parasite. The, um, the enzyme that we work on um, d uh, does this particular reaction, MEP to CDPME. A couple steps down is this compound, uh, MECPP. Um, and our compounds, 3 and 14 that I'm talking about, inhibit up here. And so what we are expecting is if you inhibit this pathway, you're going to have lower levels of that compound. And that's exactly what you see. You see the same thing with that drug, phosmidomycin. Here's um, parasites with no inhibitor. Here's when you add the drug. The, the levels of that metabolite go down. And we see exactly the same with um, our new compounds that also inhibit the same pathway. So this is really good news that um, we are, in fact, doing inside the cell what we thought we were doing inside the cell. Um, none of this is important if our compounds are toxic. And so another really important study was to see whether or not our compounds inhibited uh, the growth of human cells. So um, when we do growth inhibition assays, um, uh, the, what you're seeing here is the concentration of, uh, of the compound and the percent of uh, uh, the cells that are growing. In green are our malaria parasites. So we have two compounds here, and you can see as we increase the amount of drug, the malaria parasites start to die. 
And with one of our early compounds, you could see it took a lot longer before the human cells died. They're in black here. And with our new compound series, the data is just beautiful. So we have incredibly potent compounds that are inhibiting malaria parasite growth and leaving the human cells completely alone, which is exactly what we were looking for. So we're just beginning to put these compounds into mice. Um, and the idea is that we will see how good our bloodstream levels are. We'll try to see if we can cure some mice of malaria and then move on from there. It's, a, it's obviously a lot of steps between curing mice and curing people, but these are necessary steps and things are looking good so far. So our overall goal you know, is to develop new inhibitors that target this pathway. Um, and what we're really hoping to do is that um, because um, our uh, compounds might potentially inhibit uh, this pathway in organisms like E. coli or um, uh, other gram-negative infections that are important in the U.S., um, we might be able to pitch it to a pharmaceutical company that they could buy these drugs to uh, make money in the U.S. and that we can give away in the developing world to treat malaria and tuberculosis. And here's Pa from uh, Little House on the Prairie getting his antimalarial therapy. I uh, don't know if any of you remember that Pa got malaria. It's in the fever and egg chapter in Little House on the Prairie. Um, so I want to acknowledge uh, some of the folks that have done the work, some of whom who are here, in particular uh, Chris Armstrong, if you'll raise your hand, Chris, <laughs> in the brown, actually did most of the antimalarial uh, drug development work in my lab. Uh, the other members of my lab are pictured here. Um, the mass spec uh, work that we do is done um, with Leslie Hicks at the Danforth Plant Sciences Center and obviously the other collaborators with our um, uh, inhibitor development. And in particular, I want to thank my funding sources. Um, we get a significant amount of funding from the National Institutes of Health through the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And so this is literally your tax dollars at work, so thank you very much. And the Children's Discovery Institute, which as I mentioned, is, is directly funded by St. Louis donors. So like I said, I, I'm incredibly grateful for our funding sources. I'm uh, grateful to all of you for your time and attention tonight and happy to take any questions. So, so they are actually trying. Well, what, what's kind of nice about the parasite stage in the liver is that actually only a handful of parasites make it to the liver. So the liver stage is completely asymptomatic. People don't have elevations in their liver enzymes. They don't feel bad. They don't notice this happens at all. So even if your body came in and attacked every single cell that had been invaded by a malaria parasite, that would be like 20 cells. Not a big deal. So your liver can totally take that damage, actually. Even a, even a young infant's liver can take that damage. So um, the malaria genome was only sequenced in uh, 2002. So it's really very recent in the grand scheme of things that we even knew the genetic code of the parasite. But there are a lot of mysteries still about the malaria genetic code. So um, if you look at, say, what's another good example? The, the fruit fly genome. If you look at all the genes in the genome of the fruit fly, and you look at them and you say, well, what does this gene do? And you can look and see what it looks like, and you can say, well, that one is probably a sugar phosphatase. If you look at the malaria genome, half of the genes don't look like anything else in any other organism. So for most organisms, we have some idea of what 80 to 90% of their genes are doing. We can at least say roughly whether it's a transmembrane protein or a, a transporter or whatever it is. With the malaria genome, we could just shake our head. We really don't know. We are not good enough yet to know what those genes do. So there's a lot of room for trying to figure out what, what the parasite makes and why it needs to make it um, to try to figure out how better to kill it. Because all those things should be specific to the parasite. 
all those things would be potentially great drug targets because they don't look like anything else that's out there. So the blood stages are really tricky to target for vaccines. So there's absolutely work that's being done. In fact, Niraj Tolia, um, who's at Washington University, is really interested in, in blood stage targets. But one of the tricky things with the blood stage is that it's actually only outside of the red blood cell for 30 seconds. So when they bust open, there's so many red blood cells that they go right back in another red blood cell. So there's not a lot of time to, for instance, block invasion. So that's one of the things that people have been really interested in trying to identify are, are antibodies that would stop the parasite from invading another red blood cell. But there's, there's actually literally not enough time for a high antibody titer to, to bind to that parasite and prevent it from going in. Is there a way or do you have estimations of the potential for resistance building on any new drugs? So, so that's one of the things now that's pretty much done for any new, new drug that's being developed is that we take that drug and put it in parasites in the lab and see how quickly we can get resistant parasites to come up. Um, and so you get some idea of what the barrier to resistance will be from that, but I, I think it's imperfect for sure. Really the, the standard now for any antimalarial therapy is that you need two drugs at once, and ideally two new drugs at once that the parasite's never seen so that the odds of becoming resistant to both drugs in a single person is not high. I think we knew more about, uh, you mentioned 50% of the genes we don't really understand. If we knew more about it, maybe a way of attacking this might be to, because the malaria is linked just in the blood so rapidly in 30 seconds that we want to the next, it'd be a way to figure out the gene that affects their speed and figure out a way to slow it down, which might be Yeah, the parasite uses a massive amount of ATP, actually. So it only uses sugar. It doesn't, it act, doesn't actually use its mitochondria to make ATP, which is one of the fun things about the parasite. Um, and so actually, patients with malaria get low blood sugar because the parasite actually eats up all their own sugar. The drugs that are uh, used to treat malaria, mm -hmm. It's a great question <laughs> because our best drugs we still don't know very well. Um, and you would think we would know, right? I mean, chloroquine's been around for 100 years. And yet if you ask five malaria researchers exactly how chloroquine works, you probably get five subtly different answers. So we have some idea. What we think chloroquine does is, is make the parasite sick by making it unable to eat hemoglobin. So it, the parasite eats the hemoglobin inside the red blood cell, and it has to detoxify all the iron that comes with that, and we think chloroquine screws that up. That's what the evidence suggests, but we don't know concretely. Oh, that's a great question. So the question was if mouse malaria is a lot like people malaria, and, and it's not. <laughs> it's really not. So the mouse model we would like to use is a mouse where they make the mouse have human red blood cells, and then you can use the human parasite in a living organism, but it's human red blood cells on the human parasite because the mouse parasite doesn't give mice the same disease as the human parasite gives humans. Yes. The drug that you showed it has an anti oxalate group. Uh, it looks like it could be an iron chelate. The uh, oh the uh, phosphonamycin. Yeah. Um, it probably is with the phosphonate on it. 
Um, but we know on resistance studies and metabolically exactly how it's, how it's working in the cell. Yes? Oh, the, so the question is, how did the U.S. get rid of malaria? So that also, great question, because we all kind of wish we knew. So the, the dogma is, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers drained all the swamps. We put screens on the windows. We don't really know. So one of the, the weird things about malaria is it really follows, it follows chaos. It follows war. It follows political instability. It was all over the South during the Civil War. It, when, you, when you go to an endemic area, just building roads and, and clearing infrastructure and reducing political instability improves malaria care. So I think there are a lot of things that contributed to um, getting rid of malaria in the US, but access to care, so treating people who are sick, so there aren't reservoirs of people who have parasites in their blood. Um, and, and really, the mosquitoes in the US are really different. So in sub-Saharan Africa, the mosquitoes live inside the walls of your house. That's where the, the Anopheles mosquitoes live. In the US, the mosquitoes live outside your house. So you put up screens, and the mosquitoes all stay outside. Um, so the reason that indoor residual spraying works, so spraying the walls of your house with insecticide, is that's where the mosquitoes are actually living. So um, you know, people think the mosquitoes in Missouri are bad, but they don't know bad mosquitoes. <laughs> Yes. It's come back. That's exactly right. So DDT is, is actually the safest and most effective vector control agent. So the other agents that are used are much less safe for people and cost four times as much. So um, DDT has obviously horrible environmental implications when used unwisely, but used, for instance, in indoor residual spraying, and it's actually the safest thing for people to use inside their homes, which again shows you how bad this disease that is that people would accept you know, insecticide spraying in their kitchens as a good thing. Yes? So the malaria parasite is, is really ancient. So there are a whole lot of um, uh, parasite species that infect like gorillas and chimpanzees, and most of them don't also infect people. And in fact, there are some species that infect both gorillas and chimps, and some that are just chimp specific, and some that are just gorilla specific. But Plasmonium falciparum likes people, likes homo sapiens, not gorillas, not chimps, doesn't really cause chimp disease, even if you put it into chimps. It, it, it pretty much defines what it means to be a human, actually. So we are so, we are in direct evolutionary association with the malaria parasite. So as best we can tell, it's been around as long as we have. What you, what you just said, um, is there evidence in the fossil records about precursors of humans that they had, that they had malaria, or is it, or is it a modern? King Tut had malaria. King Tut had malaria. <laughs> oh, you mean truly the fossil? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Since there are, there are so many monkeys, malarias, and all the non-human primates have malaria, I am sure that there was an associated malaria parasite. It, there are rodent malarias. There are avian malarias. So actually, avian malaria is a particular problem uh, for penguins because they don't have good resistance to avian malaria because they don't normally live in mosquito-rich habitats. So when they come to the zoo, for instance, in, uh, in St. Louis, they have problems with bird malaria. <laughs> so it's really, it's really an, a lot of, if you have a red blood cell, you can get malaria. Yes? That's just about right. So there, there have been um, some big studies literally looking at like 
gorilla poop and looking for malaria DNA in gorilla poop, trying to trace back the origins of when malaria arose. And uh, it's thought that, um, that it did arise from uh, essentially a non-human primate malaria species, but we don't, so there's some rough estimates of when that might have been, but I don't, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Yes? So I don't think either of the two vaccines that I talked about are, are the solution, are the thing that's going to allow us to control malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. I haven't heard of anything in early stages that's, that's any better than that. So I would say in terms of trying to find a vaccine, which would be a real way to control this disease, I, I think it's at least 25, 30 years away because there's nothing even in preclinical development now that looks, looks good. There are other ways to control it. So, you know, if you could go in and give everybody antimalarial therapy three times in one year, you would have a huge effect on the burden of malaria. And we know you can have a huge effect on who has it and who gets sick when they have it just by providing better care. So in these vaccine trials, they had very few children that died from malaria, even th though we know that, that mortality from malaria in young children is really high. So just identifying who gets sick and treating them fast has a huge effect on the outcome of disease. And so if we could go in and, and, uh, and do that regularly for you know, the entire uh, African continent, then we could make a huge dent. Yes? Temperature. So the parasite is really sensitive to high temperatures. It can tolerate low temperatures fine, but it doesn't like fever, oddly enough. So um, it, it doesn't even like one degree of fever in the lab, um, interestingly. And it will, in fact, synchronize its life cycle when you, when you raise temperature. I don't know of anything in terms of low temperature sensitivity. Yes? Right, that's, that's the distribution of the mosquito. So that's all about where the mosquitoes live. Yes? Could you say something about the recent advances in diagnosis? Ah, that's a great question. So there have been some huge advances in the last um, five years or so on rapid diagnostic tests for malaria. So the standard of care are, uh, for essentially decades was what I showed you on the slides, those blood smears. So literally, pricking a finger, putting it on a slide, staining it, and having someone trained with a microscope looking at that smear and counting. Um, and as you might imagine, that takes some time. It takes trained personnel. It takes a microscope. It's not, it's not a great method um, to use regularly. Um, although it's very effective, it's, 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 it lacks some finesse. And so um, there have been a lot of interest in getting uh, better diagnostics. And so there's a couple um, urine tests now, dipstick tests, but there's also a blood test um, that's available that look at, um, that are almost like, they read out like pregnancy tests, right? One line means you don't have malaria, two lines means you do. Um, and uh, those are really um, coming online, but they're still expensive for most of the developing world. So um, uh, Washington University is associated with a field site in Malawi, and they use the rapid diagnostic tests, but it's about a dollar a test. So again, this is not a lot if it was a, a, for an American disease in the U.S., but, but there, that's, that's still quite expensive. But we could do a lot if we could improve malaria diagnostics because right now the standard of care for pregnant women and young children is to give them malaria treatment. Like a, a pregnant woman should get antimalarial treatment three times during her pregnancy. They don't smear, they don't check if she has malaria, they just give her treatment. If we could only give treatment to the people who for sure had malaria, we would save tons of money in terms of antimalarial therapy and reduce resistance. So right now we're giving antimalarial therapy to a bunch of people who don't have malaria. Yes? It has had some success in some small areas. The issue is that unless you're going to do it for, say, a continent at a time, you get imported malaria. So there have been areas that have, have made um, significant progress, 
and then it comes back in. So you really have to maintain your borders and you have to continually be vigilant. So, you know, that um, Australia is another place where there should be malaria and isn't right now. So Papua New Guinea, at, right beside Australia, has tons of malaria. And the reason Australia doesn't is that they are incredibly vigilant about stamping it out every time they find it. That's absolutely true. So um, particularly people who carry the sickle cell trait. So um, sickled cells are somewhat resistant and they also don't live as long and are cleared better by the body. And so there, there are a lot of questions, again, about why sickle cell confers resistance to malaria, but particularly people who are sickle cell carriers um, are protected against severe malaria. And that's probably why that trait is so prevalent because otherwise it would be selected against. All right, thanks.